Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia make perfect chicken marsala. Adam reviews manual citrus juicers with Julia. And Aaron makes Bridget a game-changing skillet roasted chicken in lemon sauce. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. So the first recipe I ever developed here in the Test Kitchen was for chicken marsala. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little nervous back then. And I tested that recipe dozens of times. And at the end, I was really proud of it. Well, I remember that you cooked it right here on the show 16 years ago. That mm -hmm. was season two. And I always loved that version. But nowadays, I don't make it so much anymore because that sauce is just a little too sweet for me. Yeah, well, we're wiser. Mm -hmm. We're a lot hotter. Do you know it? And our expectations for food have grown as well. And we want more complexity in our marsala sauce. That's where we're going to start. So we are starting with two cups of dry marsala this time. Ah. So we're gonna put this right into our large saucepan. And next up, it's one ounce of dried porcini mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Tons of flavor. We rinse these just to get all that dirt off the surface. Now we also want more body in our sauce. We want it to have a lot of clingability. So it sticks <laughs> right to the chicken. I like that word. We're adding four teaspoons of unflavored gelatin. So as this cooks, it's going to give that sauce some really nice body. All right, so I'm going to bring this up to the boil over high heat. Now, once it's at a boil, I'm gonna reduce that just a little bit down to medium high. We'll let this simmer until this mixture is all reduced by half. It's gonna take about six to eight minutes. Mm. We're done simmering the Marsala wine at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and pour this into a fine mesh strainer. Mm. Get rid of those mushrooms. We just needed them for flavor. We don't want them for texture. All right, we'll let that sit. So now we're going to continue with that pan sauce. I've got two cups of chicken broth. We'll add that to the pan now that we've reduced that marsala mixture. If you wouldn't mind getting that for me as well. You got it. There you are. That goes right into the sauce oh, pan. Oh, you're gonna let me do it. Absolutely. There you go. Thank you. So I'll mix this together. Now we'll bring this up to a boil, then I'll reduce the heat again down to medium high. I'm gonna let this simmer until it's reduced down to one and a half cups. That should take about 10 to 12 minutes. Let's get to the chicken. You're on it. <laughs> and we are going to create our own cutlets, and I think you have a present I there. do, I know these. These are the chicken cutlets that are made by taking a boneless, skinless chicken breast and cutting them in half horizontally. What you wind up with is a very ragged end, like this, and on this side, it's maybe three times the thickness, so they never cook at the same rate. That's right, but we have found a much better technique for creating chicken cutlets. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is a game changer. It is. All right, so we're gonna work with these one at a time. These are four six to eight ounce boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Now, we're gonna cut each of these crosswise right about at the middle. So you're separating the thin half from the thicker half. That's right. So now we have this thicker half. Now we can cut this thicker half horizontally all the way through. So now they're pretty evenly sized. Brilliant. It was probably some sort of engineer that came up with this. <laughs> it probably was. Now this to me is a total game changer and I'm never gonna cut chicken cutlets that old way again. All right, now if I look through here, most of them are of even thickness. Mm -hmm. But this one's a bit thicker. And this one, and this one, and this one. So we're gonna pound these out with a little bit of plastic wrap just until they're even with those. It's about a half inch thick. All right, so these are going to go right into a bowl. We're going to season these with two teaspoons of kosher salt and a half a teaspoon of black pepper. I'll just take a pair of tongs and toss these until they're coated with the salt and the pepper. But really, it's the salt that's going to do the work. So that salt's going to work its way into the meat and help to keep them juicy later on. And with chicken marsala, you dredge those cutlets in flour and then pan saute them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have here. I have three quarter cup of all purpose flour. I'm gonna get our skillet heated. This is two tablespoons of vegetable oil. And we'll go ahead and heat this up, medium high heat. We wanna get that pan and that oil really, really hot. Until ripping that, hot. Ripping hot. Love it when you say that, Joy. <laughs> until that oil starts to smoke. Okay, in the meantime, pair of tongs so we don't get too messy. And by we, I guess I mean me. <laughs> or you know that I love to get messy when I cook. <laughs> when I cook, there's just stuff all over me head to toe. I love that. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna put these cutlets right in the flour, make sure it's well coated. And then we're really gonna shake it off. We don't want too much flour on there. That's one of the things that can give 
the chicken, kind of a gummy coating. Yeah. All right, let's take these one at a time, place them in the flour, flip them, make sure that they're completely coated. You are not dropping a speck of that flour. I'm really impressed with your technique. Wow. You're a very clean cook. Well, this is my phone hand. Hello. <laughs> gotta keep it, gotta keep it nice and clean. All right, that is number six. I'm gonna leave the rest of them in. There's six here, six there. Mm -hmm. and we'll cook them in two batches. I think the pan is pretty hot. Yep. yep. Seeing a few wisps of smoke there. So I'm gonna turn that heat down to medium. We don't want these chicken cutlets to cook too quickly. Place them right in there, nice gentle simmer. And that is going to go fast. Really on this first side, going to take about one to two minutes until they're just lightly golden brown. All right, two minutes on that first side. Let's go ahead and flip them over. Mm. Same thing. We're not looking for tons of color here. That flavor's gonna come in the sauce. We'll let this cook another two to three minutes on the second side. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and dredge the other chicken. Sounds good. All right, second batch coming out. Those look terrific, don't they? It's really hard to get browning on small pieces of chicken <laughs> like that because they cook so quickly. That's absolutely right, but what's great is there's a little bit of fawn mm. in the bottom of the skillet. That's also going to help us with our sauce. I do want to turn the heat down to medium low because now we're going to add the magic ingredient. Mmm, pancetta. Mm -hmm. Yes. We tried all different kinds of pork, but pancetta is pretty standard in this recipe. Mm. And without it, we really didn't want to live anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Need you to stir that. All right. About four minutes is what we're looking for until it gets really nice and crispy. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and slice some cremini mushrooms. Now, Ooh. this is a pound. They do have a little bit of a deeper flavor than mm -hmm. the white button mushrooms. I do want to trim these, just the bottom a little bit. We're going to keep the stems on. I've already prepped most of these. And now, I'm going to slice these pretty thin. Now, if all you could find at the supermarket were white button mushrooms, that's fine. This recipe will work. All right, so how's the pancetta doing there, It Julia? is gorgeous. It's nice and golden brown. Almost looks like candy. I kind of want to just go in there and eat it. Is that bad? <laughs> Well, it's dangerous at this point. That is really, really hot. Now, that is a lot of mushrooms. It is. They're going to cook down to very little. They actually lose a lot of their liquid, but we want a lot of mushrooms Ooh. for a lot of flavor. So I'll toss this together. Now, this is going to cook for about eight minutes. We're going to crank up that heat up to medium high. Oh, that looks good. And then that liquid is going to evaporate. That's going to take about eight minutes. Look a lot different the next time you see it. <laughs> These are ready to go. They look delicious. Aren't they great? So we're going to take out the mushrooms and the pancetta using a slotted spoon because I want that fat to remain in the pan. We're going to use it. All right. That looks good enough. What do you think? That looks great. All right. So we're going to put this back over the heat. Another teaspoon of vegetable oil and one minced shallot. We're near the finish line, Julia. Yeah, this looks like the beginnings of a pan sauce. That's exactly right. So we made our concentrate a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And now we're just building that sauce right in the pan. So this is going to go about a minute until the shallots are starting to soften. All right, next up, a little tomato paste. Without mm. it, the sauce was just too thin, both in texture and in flavor. And this is a tablespoon. And we're going to go ahead and add one minced garlic clove at this point. Not too much. No, not too much. It really isn't about the garlic. Now, this only needs about 30 seconds to cook. All right, this is looking great. Could yep. you add that reduced marsala mixture? You got it. Whoa. Oh, that smells amazing. And this is that long cooked marsala. Remember, we've reduced it. I'm going to add a little bit more right at the end. This is <laughs> a, a little nip. Yeah, a little nip at the end. <laughs> this is a quarter cup more of our dry marsala just so we remember what we're cooking with, right? Uh, and you can actually smell that fresh marsala. Right. It has that bright flavor. All right, a little bit of lemon juice, two teaspoons, again, for brightness, and a teaspoon of fresh oregano, not the dried stuff here. We don't want it to taste like pizza sauce. This is coming up to a simmer. I'm gonna crank that heat, and now I'm going to add the chicken cutlets right back into that pan. There we go. Now we're bringing this up to a full simmer. We're gonna let that go for three minutes, and this is by design. We actually want some of that flour that's on the chicken to kind of break away in the simmer. It's gonna thicken that sauce, and we won't get a gummy coating on the chicken. So it's three minutes here. About halfway through, I'll flip those cutlets over. That smells amazing. That smells done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Put these on a pretty little platter. 
Now, back to the sauce. It's off heat at this point. I'm going to finish it with three tablespoons of unsalted butter. Well, you always finish the sauce with a little bit of butter. That's adds true. Adds that richness and adds a glossy sheen as a finish. He's my favorite of the Sheen brothers. <laughs> that sauce is looking beautiful. And you whisk like you own it. You like that? <laughs> All right. So now, a little bit of parsley. And we're going to put our mushroom and pancetta mixture right back in there. Oh, man. Where it belongs. Now that is a sauce. I'll say. So I'll spoon some of the sauce right over the chicken. Oh, hello. <laughs> mm. Here you go, honey. There oh. you are. Who's your friend? You are. It's the extra sauce that told me so. <laughs> hmm. This is better than my version 16 years ago because the sauce has a much more complex flavor with the porcinis and then those cremini mushrooms, the tomato paste, the shallots, the pancetta. Bridget, this is a fabulous version of chicken marsala. Thank you so much. Nicely for done. So for a more grown up and savory tasting chicken marsala, use a dry marsala wine and reduce it down with some gelatin and dried porcini mushrooms for body and flavor. Then finish the sauce with a splash more marsala, some lemon juice and a little butter just before serving. So there you have it. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a wiser, more mature version of chicken marsala. When life gives you lemons, well, that's when you know you need a good citrus juicer, and Adam's here to tell us which brand is worth buying. You know, Julia, we've been using this citrus juicer in the test kitchen for ages. Problem is, it proved a lot less durable than mm -hmm. we were hoping for. They chip, the enamel cracks, you end up with little pieces of enamel in your lemonade. So we're gonna get rid of that and go back to the drawing board with a lineup of 12 different citrus juicers. That's a lot. They're priced from $6 up to $23 and change, and because there were a lot of citrus juicers, we juiced a lot of lemons and limes. We used 50 pieces of fruit for most of these. Wow. Let me show you the first one. This. That looks suspect to me. <laughs> you have a good eye. It's a spout that you are supposed to Stand push back. right into a mm. whole piece of fruit. You screw it in, and then you squeeze away. What and a, you squeeze. That looks like a good hand for it, a workout. <laughs> It takes a Herculean effort to get any juice out of a piece of fruit with that. And you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, there's still a ton of juice left in there. Testers, not impressed. <laughs> Let's move on to style number two, which mm -hmm. are these two. These are handheld reamers, super familiar. Yep. They worked a little better than that. Still not great. They splatter juice oh, all over the place. They so do. It's almost like a counter cleaner at the end. <laughs> you just rub it in, get a nice fresh citrusy smell, except for the seeds that they've dropped all over the place. Tester's not very impressed with these. These ones mm -hmm. are tabletop reamers. Oh. Worked a little bit better. We got about 13% more juice out of these because they're more stable, they're more secure. You can press a little bit harder. They have these grates in the top that catch the seeds. Hmm we can still do better. All right. The last type are these. Mm. These are the presses. Now, it's the type that we used to really like. We still like this. If you haven't used one of these, they can be a little counterintuitive because it looks like you would just take the lemon half and pop it in and nothing's gonna happen there. What you really <laughs> have to do is open it up and put the fruit in cut side down, mm -hmm. and then you squeeze. And this illustrates one of the problems with this particular juicer. Look, a standard it's lemon not half. not fitting. Testers had to quarter the lemons oh, to get them no. in here. Fail. They also thought that this big, wide, sort of squared handle, not as comfortable as it could possibly be. I want you to try this guy here. Give Ooh. us some lemon Ooh. juice with that, Julia. Well, he's handsome. He's definitely handsome. He has a nice working Hinge there, ooh, holy cow. That's a lot of lemon juice out of half a lemon. So this was the winner. There are a couple of things we really liked about this. First were these slots on the bottom instead of holes, which direct the juice in a nice steady flow. They limit splattering. There's no overflowing. Testers thought that the handle was really comfortable to mm -hmm. grip. And we went back to that durability question. You know, I said that we tested 50 pieces of fruit, mm -hmm. except for this one, where we tested 200 pieces of That's fruit. That's a lot of lemon juice. And not a sign of wear on this thing. It was great. This is the Chef and Fresh Four Citrus Juicer. It was $23 and change, and it's our new winner. Pretty cool. So there you have it. If you're in the market for a new citrus juicer, check out the Chef and Fresh Four Citrus Juicer at just $23.
restaurant kitchens are built for speed. For instance, the salamander, a high output broiler that browns food in seconds. And it's integral for making a very famous dish, Rayo's lemon chicken. But the home kitchen is far from the restaurant kitchen. There's no salamander, no buckets of fresh lemon juice around, and it's hard to find teeny tiny chickens that are necessary for this recipe. But Aaron has mastered the art of recipe translation and is going to show us how to bring this great restaurant dish into our home kitchens. Yes, I am, Bridget. I'm going to walk you through all the solutions. Great. We're going to start with the chicken. Perfect. Okay. So as you mentioned, teeny tiny chickens are hard to find across the country. So we actually just landed on using three pounds of chicken parts. So we're going to start with the chicken breast. As you can see, the chicken breast is thick on one end and thin on the other end. I'm going to cut this in half. And the reason why I'm doing this is so that it cooks evenly in the oven. Now we're going to move on to our chicken quarter. So we're just going to split this in half. And there's a little natural fat line right there. And I'm just going to slice right through that like butter. Like butter. Like butter. And the chicken thigh has little pockets of fat. And I'm just going to trim those pockets of fat out of there. We had the option of brining our chicken or salting our chicken. We chose brining. I'm going to add a half a cup of table salt to two quarts of cold water. I'm just going to whisk that up until the salt dissolves. And I'm going to add my chicken. All right, so we're going to brine this in the refrigerator for about 30 to 60 minutes. So Bridget, I've taken the chicken out of the brine and I've patted it dry, and now we're going to get to our cooking. I've worked in a ton of restaurants and I've used a lot of salamanders and they're awesome. But we don't have a salamander in the test kitchen. Do you have one? <laughs> I barely have a broiler at home. I have to lie down on my kitchen floor and hold the drawer up. <laughs> Photo op. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we needed to come up with a method that would give us that really brown, beautiful, crisp skin that the salamander would give mm -hmm. us. I have a 12-inch skillet over medium-high heat with a teaspoon of oil in there heating up. And I'm going to pat my chicken dry one more time. So what we're looking for is the oil to just start smoking. Oh, yeah. So we're going to cook the skin side down. Anytime you cook in a hot pan, you always want to put food down away from you so oh, yeah. it doesn't splatter at you. All right, so we're going to brown the skin side down for about eight to ten minutes until the fat renders out and the skin gets really crisp and golden brown. Now, it might look like we've overcrowded this pan. We put all the chicken in one batch, but that is by design. Erin was very smart. She heated up the pan and the oil to the point that the oil was just smoking. That means that both the pan and the oil are hot enough to brown all the chicken all at once. So these have browned for about eight minutes on the skin side down. You ready? Oh, yeah. Look at that beautiful brown chicken. Perfection. I'm going to remove only the breast meat from the pan. Dark meat needs a little bit more time to get to the temperature than the white meat does. So we found that just by leaving the dark meat in the pan for an extra three to five minutes and browning the second side helps to synchronize the cooking texture so that they came out at the same time. OK, Bridget, we have browned the chicken for about three minutes, with just the dark meat, and see how nice and brown that is on the bottom? Yep. And pour off this chicken fat. So we're going to take two tablespoons of unsalted butter, one shallot minced, one garlic clove minced, and we're going to cook these just for about 30 seconds until fragrant. And the moisture from the shallots and the butter is going to help to deglaze all that fawn that we have in the pan, which oh. is really nice. Then as soon as you added the shallots and the garlic, yep. yeah, now we're cooking. Amen. Now we're going to add four teaspoons of flour. This is going to thicken our sauce. Now, a lot of sauces are thickened at the end, but we're going to do the reverse. I'm going to cook this for about one minute. Now we're going to add one cup of chicken broth. So Reyes uses about two cups of lemon juice in their chicken. And their chicken is amazing, but we're just going to use one quarter of a cup of lemon juice. We found that this was all that we needed for that lemon kick that we wanted. So now we're going to cook this just for about two minutes or so until it thickens up and gets slightly reduced. OK. So this is reduced for about two to three minutes. And as you can see, the liquid has gotten nice and thick. So we're going to add one tablespoon of lemon zest to our sauce. This is how you were able to reduce from two cups exactly. down to a quarter yes. cup. Yes. I we see. went to a different part of the lemon. And lemon zest can really hold up to the heat of the oven. The flavor compounds just kind of stick Ooh. with it. Can you, oh, isn't that beautiful? That is amazing. Yes. As soon as you like add in a that. lemon grove, right? Yes. Yeah. OK, so now we're going to add our chicken back to the pan. And it's really important that you keep that nice, beautiful, crisp skin, skin side up. We don't want that sauce to sog it out. We spent all that time getting it nice and brown, so we don't want to go backwards. OK, so now we're just going to add leftover chicken juices from the resting chicken. So much flavor there. A lot of flavor. Turn off the heat, and we're going to go into a 475 degree oven. And we're going to cook this for about 10 minutes until the white meat cooks to 160 and the dark meat cooks to 175. Oh, look at that. Look at that beautiful chicken. 
While that's resting, we're gonna make a fresh garnish. Okay. So I'm gonna take a teaspoon of fresh oregano leaves, a tablespoon of fresh parsley leaves, and a teaspoon of lemon zest, just to give it a little bit of fresh, fruity flavor. Okay, so I'm just gonna chop this up. Voila, we're finished. Beautifully done. Okay, so we're gonna take the chicken, it's rested nicely for about mm -hmm. five minutes. Resting the chicken right in the pan, it makes so much sense, because we take it out of the roasting pan, let it rest on the side. There's always tons of juice that comes out of it. Letting it stay in that sauce, we know exactly where all that juice is gonna go. Exactly. Okay, so you see all that fawn that builds up in the oven? Yes, so I do. We're gonna bring that back into the sauce. All right, so now I'm just whisking this so that it's nice and emulsified. And I'm gonna add half of my herb mixture to the sauce. And the other half, I'm gonna sprinkle over the chicken. All right. We wanna keep our skin really crisp, so I'm just gonna pour half of the sauce around the chicken, and I'm gonna put the other half in the bowl. I'm gonna right. serve it alongside. This is great also served with egg noodles or rice or steamed potatoes. Mm. Mm. How'd we do? I have to say, I was a little bit worried with just a quarter cup of lemon juice. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of lemon flavor in here. And that skin, it's almost like chicken chips. Aaron, this was the best lemon chicken I've ever Thank had. Thank you, Bridget. So our version of Rayo's Lemon Chicken translates a great restaurant recipe for the home kitchen. Swap in chicken parts for hard to find small chickens, brown the chicken in a skillet, and finish it in the oven in our great lemon sauce, a variation we boosted with lemon zest. And there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, skillet roasted chicken in lemon sauce. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.